Welcome back to the Killer Cortez Show. The following is an interview with Rasaja Wolf. Rasaja Wolf is a debut author from Seattle, Washington. Wolf discovered her poetic voice at an early age, using words as a means of expression and introspection. Born from her reverence for the human experience, she invites readers to delve into the depths of their own hearts and discover the beauty in the seemingly mundane. In her first book, Ember and Flame, a brand new collection of original poetry, Rasaja Wolf lays bare her own journey of self-reclamation through free verse. Before we get started, a little KC news. I just wanted to say thank you for all the love and support on the songs I've put out over the past few weeks. We've hit over a thousand Shazams this past month, and it's a little mind-blowing. It's a little big number, but it just feels like a modest benchmark for how far this project has come. Rasaja Wolf has been a friend of mine for a few years now, and earlier this year, I had the honor of being one of the test readers for her debut book, Ember and Flame. The the behind-the-scenes context that I had of her path and the adversity it took to get this book out, mixed with knowing the kind of outstanding person she is, made her story a potent one, and I'm stoked to get to share a little of that with you in this episode. She's one of the most resilient people I've ever met, and her journey was incredibly inspiring for me personally as I waded through my own challenges this past year. I interviewed Rasaja Wolf remotely from her home in Seattle. You can find the show notes, links, and a full transcription of this episode in the description below. You can also find a link to the Killer Cortez Discord where we chat all things KC. Sprinkled in between the segments of this episode are songs from my Songs for the Apocalypse playlist, some of which were chosen by Rasaja Wolf. You can find the link for this playlist in the description below, and lastly, you can also find this episode on YouTube. However, it will be without the music between the segments. If you like what I do, please be sure to give me a 5-star rating on Spotify or a follow or a comment on YouTube. Without further ado, enjoy this interview with Rasaja Wolf. What's the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled was <laughs> a Moulin Rouge style bedroom. <laughs> nice. I, I just needed, I needed curtains for my bedroom. I needed, I needed blackout curtains and I was like, how can I make this look cool? Yeah. <laughs> so, What's the best way? Did you find anything good? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of like deep red velvet. Sure, but. And we got. Yeah, I got some inspiration. So, so you hail from the PNW. Uh, why don't you give listeners a little background on yourself? Yeah, so I currently live in Seattle. I grew up in Olympia, Washington, and um, yeah, I've done. I've been a writer most of my life. I took a break for a few years, uh, running for my dreams. Lived in LA for a minute. Uh, for funsies and gosh I, I, <laughs> I don't know if it's great and then I wrote a book last year and I uh, know and it was great I <laughs> uh, know that's that's why we're here how, how did you get into writing <laughs> okay so actually I my um my literature teacher in freshman year of high school had us read the odyssey and I was super into it and it really inspired uh, a lot of my writing. I just liked the a lot of the words that was used to sp- in that specific translation um, by Robert Eagles. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and then we read Romeo and Juliet, and we read Hamlet, and and that all just really inspired me. And I started writing poetry then, and I, from there I just branched out into into other genres and other types of writing. So you've been writing for a long time then? Yeah, I would say I, I'd say I started, you know, I probably started writing even before then, maybe when I was like, I don't know, like 13 more seriously. Um, but I didn't really find my voice until I was probably 14 or 15. Damn. So are there like, are there hidden books that were hidden in drawers and burned along the way? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, yeah, I have a, a lot of work that I, I don't have anymore that I regret getting rid of because when you're a teenager, you just write some really cringy things <laughs> and, um, you know, you go back and read your work and you're like, ew. <laughs> and, and I, I have a lot of work that I regret getting rid of because, they were just musings of a teenage girl and I did actually salvage some pieces by uh, 
like searching in a really old computer at my mom's house that I used when I was younger. Classic. And yeah, I've thought about like maybe later publishing a collection of like just really, <laughs> really early <old> years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did you uh, did you get rid of any of them like dramatically? Yeah, I like burned one of them. I burned I burned a couple books. Yeah. <laughs> couple of books it's of old so songs sad. it's so sad i'm like i just want to like go and hug her and be like hey you don't need to do that yeah i let i let some <laughs> pages of songs go in the ocean super sad that's actually kind of sweet i like hope somebody found it yeah sweet but then people are like but you're littering bro that's fair um, I, mean, I mean papers biodegradable <laughs> maybe i yeah, don't know yeah your debut poetry collection, Ember and Flame, came out this past July, which I had the honor of going to the release party for. Um, what was the buildup like to your literary debut, and what has the aftermath been like? So I um, I had it in my mind when I wrote the book. Or Okay, so I had written most of the pieces, and I needed to compile it. And I was like, I want to publish this around my birthday it just has to come out around my birthday and then i got distracted by this really terrible boy and i didn't do any of my stuff and then by march i had uh let him go and so it was crunch time because i was like crap like i need to actually get serious about this and so for probably like two or three months i um was working so hard like i work a nine to five so i I do work normal office hours and um, I was I was getting up super early working on my book before work and then going to work, coming back, going straight back to my desk and working until it's time to go to sleep. And wow. <laughs> yeah, for for months, two or like two or three months. Um, and so it was like really exciting. There's a lot of push to just get this done so that it could be out in the summer just because I felt like energetically it was just a a very summery book Mm -hmm. and I I knew that if I didn't publish it in the summertime it would just not happen until next summer and I was like I just need to get this out there um so after I had actually handed the manuscript off to my book designer and formatter uh then I got to party plan and that was really fun (laughs) <laughs> great then, party yeah yeah and then it was less stressful and um and then we had the party which you were at and that was amazing and one of the best days slash nights of my life and honestly after that i kind of went into hermit mode <laughs> like, you had to recharge it makes sense yeah yeah you know it's been uh you know i could have done better with my my plan for marketing the book afterward Who and to be honest like Yeah. And it's been like, you know, it's been okay. Like I've left a lot of copies around in the city and, um, I've actually had a lot of clients at work come back and be like, wow, your book was so good. Like they ended up buying a copy and reading it and they loved it. Or I'll hear from other people that's like, oh, someone, uh, gave me a copy of your book and I didn't know like that you did that. And that was so cool. And so a lot of stuff is happening organically and it's in a couple of local bookshops, which is great. And that's awesome. I've just been, yeah, it's been really great. I I'm trying, I'm trying to let go of the guilt of not like really gunning for the marketing right now. Cause I'm kind of just enjoying the, the release of having it out there, allowing myself to slow down and like kind of recharge and get back into my creative space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these, these creative things have such long lives, like it's okay if you didn't market it now because everything you do beyond this is also marketing this. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, honestly, more than, more than any of the, you know, like monetary kickback or like the, the, um, feedback from other people is really the change within myself that Mm -hmm. I, I really value. It was like the process of putting this story into a book and then just releasing it and letting it go has opened me up to more like the next phase and the next cycle of lessons that I need to learn. And so I find I'm just so much more clear headed now in terms of my personal growth. Now that that is a chapter that I've closed on my Mm. life. 
do you, so. do you feel like the vulnerability that it took to create this, like now that you've put it out has almost made you see that like, oh, there's like another level of vulnerability that I can hit now, now that this is out. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it's only made my work more raw and more like honest and true. And I'm like, so excited. <laughs> That's cool. I love yeah. that. Yeah, because I, I feel the same way when I put out songs, especially ones that feel really close to the heart. I'm like, ah, that wasn't that bad. Let's see how far we can go next time. Uh, right? I mean, we're holding back just a little bit. Yeah. And then when you do it, you're like, oh, let's let's do that again. But like, but more. Yeah, we'll jump from higher this time. Yeah. Where does the title Ember and Flame originate from? So Ember and Flame came from so the book is kind of essentially a master class in the wisdom of fire it's it was the element of fire was a big inspiration for a lot of the pieces and the um, symbolism of transformation that fire brings was very important to me and it felt like that year that i wrote the pieces in the book um which I don't know if I've mentioned yet, is a collection of original poetry and many fictions. So mm -hmm. a collection of a lot of different work. But um, the year that I wrote the pieces in the collection was like trial by fire. Like it was very much the best and worst year of my life. It was extremely chaotic and ultimately the tone, you know, can I... Can I just read you one of the pieces? Yeah. Can I read one of the pieces? Of course. Yeah, okay. I was going to ask you to read them anyways, but let's just dig right into it. Love okay, it. Okay, I'm just going to read, well, I'm just going to read the one that's on the back of the book. It's in the, it's on the back cover. Okay. And this is kind of um, the essence of the book, and this will explain better than I can. Um, let's go. Here's your Costco <laughs> sample, guys. All right, guys. Uh, this one is called In Light. I was an ember a nearly spent glow facing night alone. I feared and wondered the wait until daybreak to bring reprieve from the dark. But as I endured, I began to remember I was once a fire before I was an ember. And then I realized I need not wait for the dawn to be saved. I need only burst into flame. So that's that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, I think upon you reading that, I think I just got it for the first time, like, thinking about it that way and realizing that, like, the the ember is after the flame, but it's the it's the process of becoming that. I think <laughs> I think inherently, like, I would I would think to start before the flame. So it's cool that you did it that way. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just, I guess everyone... Because life is a perpetual cycle of death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of the biggest lessons I took from, uh, there's this book called Women Who Run With the Wolves um, that I personally think everyone, especially women, should read. Mm -hmm. um, but it, one of the most important lessons it starts out with is like everything is cyclical and everything is death and rebirth. So you, it's life, death, and life. You're going to feel like you're in a death cycle sometimes where everything is ending and everything is the worst and you're scared and you don't know what's what's what and all you have to do is trust that direction is going to find you and you are going to be shown the way and life is going to come after and that's such an important sentiment to really like allow to take a root in you because we all face dark nights of the soul mm -hmm. and when we're there it's painful. We don't have to suffer as long as we're willing to trust that we're going to be shown the way. And I think with embers and with flame, it's like, you, you know, like if you have a sage, like a, um, a bundle of sage uh -huh. and you light it and it's kind of smoldering and if you blow on it, it starts to like spark, right? So you're adding oxygen to it. So embers can turn back into flames or they can start new fires Ember. right but you just need to like it's the trust it's the oxygen that it bursts back in like it was something before and it can be something again 
Well, and sometimes we all feel like that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that it's funny. I've had this idea. I actually have it written down as an idea for a future song. Um, that like life is just a series of trust falls, and and I, I had a mentor that she told me that when I when I first got into the arts that like she's like look you're, when you start like you're not going to know how you're going to eat in two weeks, and you just have to know that that hand is going to come, and you just have to have that faith and. And, uh, that really imprinted, imprinted heavy on me. And, um, so that really resonates with me. And also the thing with the, uh, with the sage. So we, we burn a lot of sage here in the studio yeah. and our walls are pretty much carpet lined. So every time I'm like walking <laughs> through, I see those little embers. I'm like, no, 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 no. Contain, <laughs> contain yourself, please. <laughs> the secret ingredient is danger. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we burn alive today? We'll see. Oh, God. Um, without divulging too much from the collection, what are some sample meanings behind the different sections of the collection? Yeah, absolutely. So there are seven sections in this collection. Um, it Each section does tell its own story, and then the collection as a whole tells a story as well. So there's... Um, the first section is called Starlight. Love um, that name. And I, thank you. I called it Starlight because it's just another word for sunlight. Sunlight is starlight yeah. to me, but I didn't want to like really lean into this. <laughs> There's a sun on the front of the cover. I didn't want to be like, yeah, you know, laid on too thick. <laughs> but Starlight is just such a pretty word to me. So Starlight is just. Uh, it's my honestly, it's my favorite pieces in the book. Um, it's the pieces that were I felt like they just came to me. They mm-hmm. I didn't pretty much every piece in here. There was no editing done. Um, it just my first draft was the way it was, and I didn't feel the need to touch it at all. And um, those felt like just really light and pretty and a good introduction to the book. So I compiled my favorites in Starlight. And it's kind of just like the essence of like, like how my, my mind and soul was during like the best moments of that year. And then at the second section, Obsidian is a little bit of a darker tone. They explore artist block and self doubt and the sense that one is not living up to their full potential. Um, it leans wistful and melancholy, wow. I would say. Um, and that, that story, I think when I started writing the pieces, I was very artistically blocked. I was in this really, um, toxic relationship that I needed to leave. And I was in a place where like, I wasn't doing anything with my life. I was just existing and I was ignoring the work and I was running away from it and I wasn't writing and I wasn't doing anything. And so. Uh, I started with a, the obsidian section because that was the starting place. That's when I was the ember. I felt like I was dying. I love that because I think I think a lot of that might be the most relatable section. I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah, it's it sucks. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's, it really does. It does, but it's like you said, it's like the trust fall, right? Yeah. It's like you have to trust. Like you just you have to go out there. You should go outside. <laughs> Well, to, to your point is like, you have to provide that oxygen. Like it was funny. I was talking to somebody about this, um, just yesterday he was talking to me about like having some difficulties right now. And I just told them, I'm like, dude, like, you know, all the things about like therapy and talking to people. And, but honestly you need to play offense. Like you need to go and just take some actions in your life that you're taking with your own conviction and power. And that's how you bring control back to your life. Um, What about Dragonfire? So the third section, Dragonfire, is the name is inspired by my animal totem that I had that year. So every year I choose a spirit animal. And it kind of depends. It's it it they come to me in different ways, but it's really just a way to like focus my my energy that year into like 
looking for the lessons. Like I'm always trying to look for the next lesson. Like what am I supposed to learn this year? Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has like a word of the year and I have an animal of the year. And I have this like spirit animal oracle deck that I'll I'll use a lot, but I've sometimes it's, it just doesn't come from that. But that year I did pull the dragon card. Ah. And I yeah, and I realized and it's funny so I was I was in that toxic relationship. I was in in Obsidian. I was super blocked and I pull this dragon fire or this dragon card and I read the description and I knew immediately I was like, I'm going to break up with him this year. Wow. But I didn't like, but then I pushed it down. I was like, no, no, I'm not. I'm yeah. not gonna. We're getting married. <laughs> yeah. Damn. I was like, no, that's not real. Like he's the love of my life. I'm so happy in this relationship that I hate so much, you know, like, oh my God. It, so, Right. So I, anyway, so I pulled the dragon card and the year very much became about seeing my true self. And the dragon energy is about seeing all. That's kind of the, the I don't know if mantra is the right word for it, but the dragon mm-hmm. is I see all. And you cannot hide from your true self if you're seeing all. It represents... The wisdom of fire, which is destructive and creative and transformative. Uh, I knew, I knew that it was going to be a wild ride. And so, yeah, it was definitely like a lot of the pieces that I wrote during my process of waking up to who I really was mm-hmm. and like facing my outer circumstances and exploring how uh, it can feel like working through resistance and acceptance and then finally moving to full embodiment of who you are. Um, so Dragonfire is like very introspective and raw and cathartic. Um, but yeah, it's about like, so if you think of Dragonfire, it's like, it's destructive, but it can be, that can be deliverance, right? Yeah. That can be salvation. That can free you from bondage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, things dragon need, fire was mm-hmm. th- things need to get destroyed in order for things to get rebuilt. Exactly. Exactly. There's let's see, how did I say it? The creativity holds power to self self destruction. Hmm. Um, I had a similar thing happen when I read that book, Thinking Grow Rich, I think. I think it was that one. I read that book and the person I was with at the time, I was like, Fuck, I'm gonna have to break up with this person. Mm. But it, it hit me like a ton oh, of bricks. No. Hit me like a ton of bricks. <laughs> I was like, same, but like the same exact thing. I was just like, took way <laughs> longer than it should have. So wait, how long? How long was it for you? I was like another year. It took oh another no! Year. Yeah, I fought it. I, I fought it, was, it pretty hard. I thought it was going to be another year when I when I settled back into. Like, you know, when you're in a relationship that you're not supposed to be in, you know, there's phases where you're like, I hate this. This is just the worst thing ever. And then you just trick yourself into thinking that you're happy and you're like, oh, no, I can do this. Like, things are great. Yeah. And I called I really trauma bonding people. Yeah. <laughs> and I really thought I could do it for another year. Uh, at least, I mean, I just, well, I thought I could do it forever. I'm surprised that I, I didn't with how much i gaslighted myself but <laughs> i think i only made it i think i only made it another like four or five months good on you until i tapped out yeah nah I, I i let it go too long but it's all right each teach own their own path right i mean there's always i mean you're there as long as you need to be right yeah so for the listeners can can i get you to read one more absolutely yeah which one would you like so i think i want to hear soul fire did you want to hear about the rest of the sections we can save that for the list soul unless fire. you want to, unless there's one you really want to talk about we want to get them to buy the book that's fair i'll just say so Merkwood is the the fourth section and uh i just wanted to say that so dragon fire was facing your outer demons and basically learning to set boundaries and create the life around yourself that you want. And once you've created that stability, then it moves into murk, what, but just facing your inner demons. So then going, being able to go into the shadow realm 
and inside and then work being ready to fa- like strong enough to face your shadow uh-huh. at that point. So probably my favorite. Do you ever watch Scott Pilgrim? Yeah. That's like the the neg- the neg- <laughs> Scott. That's the that's the Merkwood right there. Where he has to like fight himself. <laughs> it's funny uh that you're not the only person who has said that. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> People just love Scott Pilgrim. All right. Okay, so you wanted to hear Soul Fire. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, right. Soul Fire. I see the way time takes a piece of you every day, the way age weighs on your soul, as if each passing year, the fire you have carried grows colder, like a flame at the end of a wick. And I wish I could bear it for you. I wish I could take that fire and place it in a heart and watch it grow to its once breathtaking size. Then you would never die because your core would burn so bright. But I cannot bear it for you. So I carry you as your fire dances its final dance. Visible in your eyes are glimmers of your original spark. They whisper of eons you have lived and of eons your light will still burn. Your eternal embers, may they find me in the next life too. I love that. Um, Why don't you go over one more section? Okay. How about, just because I like the name so much, Hearthfire. So Hearthfire, the fifth and shortest section of the book. Um, Hearthfire to me means the human spirit. That's kind of the namesake I put with that I, I thought about just naming the section the human spirit but it didn't really go with the theme yeah but hearth fire being like the heart fire like the fire within the heart mm-hmm. um it's uh it's a reference to a an earlier poem in the starlight section its tones are like mysterious and empowering and kind of dramatic <laughs> um but yeah, it's it's just about the human, the indomitable here, human spirit, like that feeling of when you feel your most strongest, when you have faced the things that you need to face, and you feel very empowered. How you show up when you are in your power is mm. the tone with that section. Was that was that like um, after your dark season? Did you have a moment where you're just like, oh damn, I have arrived earth fire oh yeah i was full dragon at that point <laughs> <laughs> i was like okay I, I get i understand the energy of the dragon now like when when someone needs to embody that it's like you are all powerful you are all seeing you are seeing all um and it also i mean it also tackles like other things that are like just basically the human condition but a lot of it is very much like like i am strong and like here i am i love that yeah you're not you're not trying to be something you just are something what is a film you wish you made like a film that exists yeah currently or a film i wish i had made like 10 years ago when i wrote a script for it (laughs) Honestly, you, you can, you can interpret any <laughs> that any way you want. That that's awesome. <laughs> a film I wish that I made. I don't know. That's a weird question. Like just we're any weird any movie, any movie, and be like, oh, I wish I wrote that. Yeah, but like the top one, not just any one. The top one. Oh gosh. Um. Hold on. I wish I wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Like. The, the the film and and the books or just the film oh the film i mean it's it's no, it will never be redone that's some of the best the best screenwriting in all of human history full disclosure i you didn't hate it. I, I didn't like lord of the rings one oh my god i, I hated lord of the rings <laughs> one i don't know i was i was young but still like i I remember leaving that theater. Like I liked all of it till the very end. Cause for some odd reason, like it felt like this giant build and the last fight felt so like meek and I get it. Like there was two more to happen. <laughs> and then I got it after the fact I was like, all right, that had to be that way. And yes, it's amazing, but I'm just saying. Okay. Well, 
we can agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know. I watched it. I watched the trilogy for the first time when I was in like eighth grade. And immediately I knew this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm going to watch this a yeah. hundred more times in a row. Like, <laughs> what, are, what are your like your favorite uh, themes behind like Lord of the Ring? Or like, what do you love about it so much? Gosh, that's a really, that's a big question. It's a, it's a good question. So I'm kind of a sucker for stories that tell these big, like good versus evil stories. Mm-hmm. Like, like Star Wars, like Moana, um, where it's like there's a very clear evil that people need to kind of like band together to face. Mm-hmm. And I think with Lord of the Rings specifically, and especially with how it ended, um, I there's a YouTuber that made this really great mini documentary on it that put into words my feelings so well and i do not remember who it was but they they basically distilled it down to lord of the rings is talking about how good and evil will always be at odds but good doesn't necessarily have to win out because evil will always destroy itself that put it together so well for me and i'm sorry to the creator who who said that and i i can't credit you because i don't remember who you are but thank you for that um because it was just really beautiful and 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 the story was like that kept happening in the trilogy was like evil would just like shoot itself in the foot and like ultimately it was just a really beautiful tale of the human spirit of yeah classic evil trait is just hubris right that's interesting so it's funny because when i think of you like i don't i don't think of you necessarily as like a person who sees things as black and white like good or good or evil but those themes are so universal. Um, and I, I'm the same. Like I, I shamelessly love like Marvel movies and like any, any kind of movie like that. I just, I don't know what it is. Sometimes it just, it pumps me up and yeah, I know like it has, sometimes it has like a format or whatever, but I'm like, whatever this thing right. just speaks to me in some way. Well, and it's funny to me too, because like, I'm also not a black and white person. Like I, there's so many times we'll look at two conflicting things and be like, yeah, both can be true. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But something about the storytelling when it comes to just a classic good and evil, because I don't think it's because a lot of us in our um, per- personal journeys, our personal mythology, a lot of it does feel like that, where it feels like we're up against something like really monumental. Yeah. I'm a sucker for the hero journey, for sure. If I had to describe you to someone who didn't know you, one of the first descriptors I would use is mystical. Um, what's been your latest obsession in the esoteric realms of the cosmos? <laughs> so, um, I've been studying a lot of conjuration and evocation magic lately. Okay. What's that? So conjuration is like calling up a spirit or like an entity and evocation is like the same thing. So you're you're calling up. And I to be honest, I haven't called up a specific entity yet. I'm still not really there. And to be honest, I've spent the last month kind of I've been busy falling in love. So I haven't been doing a ton of spell work. Um, but I've been reading about it and studying it from both a religious point of view and like a pre-Christian and like a early pagan point of view and searching out texts from different perspectives so I can get a really full view on um, like how one would safely conjure or evoke spirits and also just trying to learn like what how what the mechanics are of it and so I've gotten really good at like the ritual opening like the the protection spells that you would do before calling in an entity um, and I'm sticking with that for, <laughs> for yeah, now. Yeah, getting your reps. But in. because it's, it, yeah, well, it's interesting because when you you can use that as like a primer for any spell, it doesn't have to be like a an evocation spell. And so I have been doing spells for other people. Um, like I've 
like one person was being harassed by this guy and I was like, well, I can use some practice. Why don't you send me his name? <laughs> so so I used the same ritual opening in one of the books I have. And I used that to like charge the spell. And then I did the spell. And like the next day, this guy was out of the picture. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. That's a yeah, so that's right fun. there. <laughs> yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> How What what got you um, interested in, in all that? So I really dive deep into my creative projects. I'm a huge fan of thought experiments. And in the novel that I'm writing right now, um, which there's a chapter one excerpt in the back of my limited edition version of the book. It's I not included in the standard. Yeah. So if anyone wants, I have a few copies left of the limited special edition. So if anyone does want it, you can hit me up on Instagram and I'll send you a copy. Yep. Um, but anyway, so this novel that I'm working on, um, it does. Here, can I just read the short description of the novel? This read will it. explain it. Okay. This ties in, obviously. <clears throat> Around the same time I stopped writing for Ember and Flame, I began writing pieces for my second collection, and I also started drafting a novel. I wanted to include an excerpt from the new book. Okay, well, that you don't need to hear that. Currently still unnamed, but with a handful of chapters and concepts fleshed out, this story explores themes of generational trauma and family curses which follow a group of siblings through childhood and into their adult lives. How does a chaotic upbringing affect siblings differently? How does it affect their relationships with each other? How does it influence the way they perceive and interact with the world? To what lengths will they go to run from the ghosts that haunted their parents and now linger with them? What does it take to face your demons? What do unbreakable sibling bonds look like? How far would one go to avoid leaving a sibling behind? So those are all questions that I explore with the novel. Um, and one of the mechanisms I use is ghosts and um, and demons. And so I haven't decided to what extent I want them to be symbolic or real yet in the novel. But... I was thinking about how my sister said when she was a kid, and she remembers this, she was like, there was this woman that would sit by my bed and talk to me. And the only word she had to describe it at the time, because we were brought up Christian, was demon. And so I read in this book, and I'm like, well, I'm basing it off of my siblings, and my sister had a demon. So I want to learn I want to learn how to summon a demon and I want to summon that one. And I want to talk to her and ask her what that's all about. Like, what were you saying to her? Why were you haunting my family? Um, so yeah, big thought experiment. I'm super into just like, you know, method acting, basically like going straight into the work and like, like a realm journalist. Yeah. Um, that's crazy because I have multiple friends. So one friend, his mom, and she's she's a twin. His mom, when they were kids, used to see little people at the foot of their bed. Both of them would see it, and like to yeah, this I mean, day, they're they're like you know older now. To this day, like one just straight up has panic attacks when they talk about it. Um, uh, and then another friend currently has like woken up to entities like sitting at the foot of her bed, and sometimes it's like a figure. Sometimes it's just a shadow. Um, and then I've had, I've had other friends who said like that they've seen like, you know, shadow people in the corner or whatever. I mean, I, it's so wild to me cause I, I've never seen that consciously. Like I think I've had dreams about it and it's hard to like tell what's real and what's not, perfect, um, perfect. but that's, that's super interesting. Yeah. Do you, do you go into that? Like what's your feeling going into that? Are you like excited, like a little nervous? A little all the above? Well, I think that there's a, a healthy amount of fear. Like you, if you approach something with respect, um, a lot of times that will feel like fear. I think that, um, I think we, we briefly talked about this before and you mentioned like the term spiritual grizzlies. Like there's things that yeah. you shouldn't mess with. And I think that's very much true. I was speaking with one of my... Um, one of my other friends who's a he's like a seventh generation guru from india like grew up in a monastery he's a 
tantric teacher. He knows about a lot of this stuff. Like he studied the spiritualism aspect and there are demons and angel, like you know, demonic and angelic entities in the Hindu tradition as well. And so he was talking to me about this. He basically said the same thing, that there's some things that don't know how to handle themselves. And it doesn't matter how careful you are, just like if you approach a grizzly, it's going to hurt you. And so to be careful what you're approaching. So I'm very careful of like, there's only a specific order of entities that I would be working with. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, there's also a level of, we don't know if these things are actually real or if they're manifestations of things in our psyche. And so I think I'm, I'm approaching it with a healthy amount of respect. Like I'm definitely, there's things that make me nervous. And if I'm scared, then I'm not going to force myself to do anything that I think I'm really uncomfortable with. Yeah. Um, I think that my, but at the same time, you know, spiritual teachers will say, if something scares you, go toward that. Because like, you know, part of, part of mine is like, well, I was always raised to be like scared of this and I want, I don't want that to control me. And yeah. so I want to learn about it. And the more I learn about it, the less afraid of it I'll be. Um, and also I feel very protected. I feel like I've, uh, I feel like if you approach these things with respect, as opposed to like a mocking in a mocking way, mm -hmm. like if you approach it, um, like I'm better than you and you can't hurt me and you're just a, you're just a, a measly thing. It's like, the, no, these things have been around for thousands of years. Like just calm down. Like maybe, maybe be nice for a second because all living things are deserving of love. Right. I don't know if that answered the question. I just rambled for a really long time. No, I mean, I, I think my, my, my thoughts on it are like the metaphysical and consciousness is it's, it's a realm that is similar to what, you know, when we explore space or when they were exploring the North American continent for the first time, like I look at you and you're doing that. And it, it reminds me of like a Lewis and Clark explorer. Like you can kind of prepare for all of it and like talk to some people who might've walked that path before, but truly you're just going to go through and you know, what's going to happen is what's going to happen. And that's, but to me, that's, uh, it's brave, but also necessary. Cause I, I think at least for me and the studies that I do, it seems like it's a, it's a frontier that's being explored more and more. And it's, right. and it's weirdly like all these topics that are like paranormal, metaphysical, they're all kind of converging to this one space. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting that you're doing that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, it's, it's nice to have a focus. I think that at risk of sounding a little arrogant, um, I, so I, I've never, I haven't had the gift of like <clears throat> seeing it, seeing a ton, of, like I don't see a ton of shadow people and I don't see a ton of entities I have. It's not like my, that's not my gift. Uh -huh. Um, my gifts have have been in seeing things in dreams, like getting information in dreams that I would not have been able to get uh, obtained in the real world at all, or um, remote viewing, like finding lost objects that I just know are in a place. I just know where they are, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Or more, even more, like personal based, like empathetic things, like being able to feel what someone's feeling without them having to say anything, like very subtle things. And on top of that. Um, having kind of a natural shield just with whatever's in my my soul map is I've been around people and gone with people to places where they've continually been haunted and whenever I go there's no harm that happens so there's kind of a term for that there's like I think I've heard some people call it a shield where there's some people that do have a little bit of a, a thing in their in their spiritual or energetic makeup that means that they're a little bit naturally more protected mm -hmm. and that's possible that that's why i don't get haunted and i don't get approached by negative spirits mm -hmm. and if that's true then then maybe it means that it's a little bit safer for me to go into that space so hmm. I don't yeah that's that's interesting because i i don't know same like i've i've been around a lot of people that have seen things I guess I've seen some UFO stuff, 
but um i always kind of wonder I've, I've had this thought in my mind recently is like you ever see hook in that movie i don't know i i did not see that yet so not what happens without without spoiling it is like the whole the whole thing behind it is like pan loses his belief and he can't he can't see the things that kids can see and it's because right. he he doesn't believe it and like to what you were saying is like we're not sure if when we travel into these realms that we're traveling through a realm are we like projecting it like is it coming from us and and i always wonder that like what if what if it is just like pan and what if it's a hybrid of both like maybe it is real <laughs> but you have to believe it's real in order to see it i was gonna say it's so in the book i'm reading called one of the many books i'm reading right now called demons of magic by gordon winterfield mm -hmm. um he talks about how a lot of this the ritual opening or the protection ritual that you use when you call in the archangels to prepare the space for a um a summoning of one of these goetic demons yeah. um a lot of it has to do with imagination and like picturing things and imagining things and it's very powerful and it sounds like you know, weird. It's just, it's just your imagination. It's just in your head. I think there's an in between. I think there's, I think it helps you get halfway there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's describing it super well, but I mean, I personally was like, this is weird. Like, I don't think this is going to work. But like the second time I did the, op the ritual opening, like the energy in the room shifted and the temperature dropped. So I was like, okay, interesting. Well, this is something happened there. So, um, I think, I think it's a hybrid of both. Like you said, Whoa. I think it's a little bit of us and a little bit of like something that we can't understand yet. Interesting. I could talk about this stuff all day. What's one thing people would be surprised to hear about you? <laughs> Usually in my, in my normal life, it's that I'm like a sorceress in training. <laughs> well, we already got through, we already got through yeah, that. We, so. Yeah. That's you know, it's my, my funny. audience that's, is down with that anyway. So, well, that's that's what I drop on the on first dates to like see if people can hang. <laughs> You're like, so I'm a sorceress. Yeah, I'm like, if that scares you, I'm letting you leave early. Yeah, you are just like you can just get out now because it's fine. If it's not for you, that's cool. But just so you know, <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, something that would surprise people. Um, I. I was homeless for a bit in 2022 and slept in my car for a few months. And mm -hmm. people are kind of mind blown when they hear that because if anyone, anyone who knew me, like would not have been able to guess. Um, so that's always fun to drop on people. Yeah. You had Surprise. a, uh, you had a cool podcast that you shared with me that actually I found, I found myself weirdly obsessed with because it's just such a like raw story and hearing it. It was like watching a, a really, addictive TikTok or something it was interesting That's you know like I, I like binged the whole thing pretty much um because you, you were like already well off like totally out of that scenario but so how did that influence the writing of the book would you say like I'm sure it influenced it a bunch of ways but I guess in review yeah so that my my houseless experience was at the end of the year that I wrote that book and I went into that experience knowing that I was not going to leave that experience empty-handed. I was like, I cannot be homeless and sleeping in my car and not leave with something. And so it forced me to it forced me to turn to my writing and to use that as solace and as comfort during some of the darkest moments of my life. And I I kind of finished my writing the the um the content that would go into that book, but then I was like compiling it. So then I spent a ton of time just organizing it and typing everything up from the handwritten manuscripts because I write everything by hand. Um and then yeah, it was really that that was like that that was the trial. Well, the Holy Ghost trial by fire, but that was like the crucible. That was like all right, let's see what you learned. <laughs> you know. Yeah. When when you were experiencing your homelessness, do you was part of it like conscious where you were like, 
and knowing that it takes a ton of pressure to turn like a piece of coal into a diamond? Yeah, I was, I went into it with a lot of acceptance and it's not, that's not an attitude I think I could have uh, approached something like that with at any time before that year. Cause I think that whole year was, it was transformative enough to prime, prime me for, for the end of that year when I was in my car. Um, and so I just blanked on your question. Can you repeat it? I'm so yeah, I know it's, it's like, it's like, for example, for me, like I know I thrive under pressure and when I like, I yes. have, I have this crazy ass habit of where like sometimes I'll just come right up against a deadline and I'm like, and then I have to get it done. Cause it, it helps me focus. Yes. Yep. Exactly. And that's, that was, I was just viewing it as a test of faith. I was viewing it as like, okay, either I can crumble and I can leave, leave this like with a bad attitude or I can let this be something that I look back on and see that I turned a really, really shitty situation into a time that I'm really proud of. That's awesome. When you, when you look at physical copies of the book, do you see that vision? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I do. Cause, because I designed the cover while I was homeless wow. and, and I, it came to me like the name and the cover came to me while I was homeless. And so I was like, I know what I'm going to do. And so when I look at it, it's like a reminder. It's like, Hey, like, look what you did. Like the, look where you came from and what you went through. Fuck. Yeah. I love that. As an author, artist, adventure, spellcaster, explorer, what does the ultimate adventure look like to you? <laughs> oh my God. Like anything in the universe. Yeah. Oh my God. The ultimate adventure, like fun or like action packed. Whatever like, you want, this, whatever you want it to oh be. Oh my God. I could talk about this for hours. Okay. I would, mm, I would want to go on some like Skyrim style adventure where I'm like having to befriend a dragon and like go defeat a monster. Okay. Like that would be so terrifying and fun. <laughs> Real life, what would you have like, uh, <laughs> like, like lives like in a video game, or is it just like one life, one adventure? I mean, if if being able to respawn is an option, <laughs> can we add in double jump? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get one or the other, respawn or double jump. Oh no, <laughs> respawn! I'll take nine lives, please. <laughs> that would be so sick if you could respawn. What's the first thing you would do if you could respawn, like in real life right now? <laughs> oh God, I would, I would like, I would try and with like without any previous experience, I would just try and summit Mount Everest without an oxygen tank. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I successfully do it, mega clout. <laughs> yeah, but if I die. It's good. See, you're giving yourself the option of, of maybe living. My brain went straight to like, dude, you're skydiving from space, no helmet, right into the <laughs> ground. Just like using up the life. But wait, but why? That doesn't make sense because you will have the same experience with the proper equipment. <laughs> this is true. Just this is true. It doesn't change the skydiving. That's a good the point. Helmet. That's a, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> All right. I will wear a suit straight into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, what, oh, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? <laughs> Sorry. You're imagining um, the cratering. I see it. I'm going supersonic. Oh, no. <laughs> the the, the like light a cartoon character. Yeah, the light turns from like from like amber <laughs> to blue to green as it like plunges right straight in. Oh, I'm gonna no. land in New Mexico. You're gonna start like an earthquake. <laughs> like, oh shit. I'm gonna destroy a city by like, accident. At that velocity? Like not slowing down. 
I still do okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <clears throat> what advice would I give my 20 year old self? Um, I would, you know, I don't know if I would give her advice so much as I would sit down with her and, and be like, Hey, like you're, you're good enough. And I would just, I think I would just tell her it's going to be okay. And I would just hug her and tell her that like she's enough and that she's lovable and yeah, just the things she needed to hear. I like that. Um, I just have a few more questions for you. What should I have asked you, but I didn't? <clears throat> oh, um, you know, that's not a question I was prepared for. <laughs> um, where, where can you find my book? Um, <laughs> that, that's counting two questions from now. Okay. <laughs> um, what is my top album of the year? Okay. What's your top album of the year? Okay. So I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I thought of it myself. <laughs> I have a, I usually have like a favorite album every season. And this summer I stumbled across Emma Rosa's album Sting. And I may have actually sent it to you, but it's like this whole 80s throwback vibe. It's so good. I know it's cliche to really like 80s throwback sounding music right now, but I don't care. That album, iconic. It's okay. so good. Everyone listen to it. Well, uh, yeah, there's going to be songs interspersed on this, and I'm sure we're going to throw some Emerosa on there. Yes. Um, any ask or request for my audience or any last parting words? Yeah, I would say um, if you're interested in my book, feel free to check it out on Amazon. Under You can just search for Saja Wolf or Ember and Flame, and it'll pop right up. I would love to connect with you on Instagram. I'm Rasaja Wolf on Instagram. Um, and I do have limited edition copies of my book left. Um, you can just DM me. Those are not available online. And yeah, if you if you are experiencing a dark time or or you are uncertain or you're scared. I promise that the light is coming and you just need to trust that you will be shown the way. Get that trust fall. Rasaja, thank you so much for coming on the KC show. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you so much. And we'll be talking to you soon. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Once again, thank you to Rasaja Wolf for coming on the KC show. Go check out her debut book, Ember and Flame. A link to the book on Amazon and Kindle is in the description. You can find other episodes of the Killer Cortez show my socials, show notes, links, and a full transcription of this episode at thekillercortezshow.com. You can listen to my music, buy some merch, or show your support over at killercortez.com. You can also show support for the show by giving us five stars or Spotify or a like or a comment on YouTube. Thank you for listening, and until next time, adios. Adios.